hosted by Expedient and Aleda. We are joined today by two amazing technologists who are going to walk us through best practices on how to prepare for the future of multi-cloud. We anticipate the session will last close to 60 minutes, but we will certainly leave time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, my name is Heidi Altry. I will be your moderator today. But before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple housekeeping items with you. First, all, of it, all attendees will be in listen mode only, and audio is provided by accessing your computer or phone using the number provided. Today's webinar will be recorded, and a link will follow in an email communication, usually within the next day or so. You'll see a chat panel on your screen for Q&A icon or Q&A icon when you hover over the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask any questions in the Q&A panel and we will be drawing prizes um, for those who ask really great questions today. We'd love to know your thoughts and ask that you participate with a few poll questions we've enabled throughout the presentation. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today, AJ Kuftik, Principal Technologist at Expedient, and David Romero, Senior Technologist at Aleda. Guys, it's all yours. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is AJ Kuftik. I'm Principal Technologist at Expedient. Uh, I want to thank you guys all for joining us today. Um, this is the housekeeping slide uh, from, uh, from Heidi uh, that I forgot to share out. I'm sorry about that. Um, for those of you who are new to Expedient, uh, we were founded in 2001. We started as a co-location provider, um, and we uh, branched into managed services and cloud. Uh, we have cloud locations in U.S. East, Central, and West in our West region where Heidi is just opened at the end of 2019. Uh, we have international cloud deployments in our customer data centers in Australia, Germany, and Canada. So if our cloud locations don't work, uh, we can bring that cloud to you. Uh, we've been recognized by Gartner for DR as a service the last three years in a row. We've been a VMware cloud provider since 2007. Uh, that was the start of the program. We have 40,000 VMs running on our uh, VMware platform. So we've been running VMware at scale for over a decade now. And we're also a Zerto Platinum partner. So before we talk about the concept of multi-cloud, I want to talk about work. Um, and one of the things that we look at when we look at work are there's, you know, kind of these smaller buckets of work that we can kind of put everything into. One of them is business projects. So this is where the business comes to us as IT and they want to generate new revenue. They want to put a new feature into the product. They want to be able to do, you know, enable bulk ordering. Um, those sorts of things where they're trying to improve their business processes. There's internal projects. This is where we take our architecture and we try to improve it to make it more resilient. We notice that our storage array has been falling down. So we wanna to move to a hyper-conversion infrastructure. We wanna move away from managing it ourselves and moving it out towards cloud. This is also where you start to do things like automation and, and improving your ability to service the business. There's also unplanned work. Unplanned work is the things that go boom. Right? This is where you get called in the middle of the night because there's a problem or um, even to the point of somebody puts in a change in code to do one of these business projects and creates a regression that causes a bunch of work that, have to, that has to be done in order to fix it. So that's unplanned work. You didn't have that on any docket. And then finally, we have planned work. So those are patches, hardware refreshes, capacity management, um, all of the things that we do as IT to keep the lights on. Um, but we can kind of group all four of these into two larger buckets. Our business projects and our internal projects are high value work. This is what the business is looking to do. This is what we are trying to do to improve our services. This is the higher value work. This is what gets you the kudos. This is what gets you the attaboys. This is what gets bonuses. So this is where we want to focus our efforts and attention. At the same time, we have to keep the lights on. And that's honestly low value work. We want to make sure that the lights stay on, but if you're keeping them on or if we're not, having, we're not able to uh, keep the lights on and things start to go down, our value as IT starts to drop and we're not able to generate um, the, necess the necessary resources that the business is looking for. And this is where we like to refer to the CF work. 
where if you do a good job, you get a C and a thank you. And if you do a poor job, you get an F and you're fired. So why cloud? We're talking about multi-cloud, how to prepare for the future of multi-cloud, but why cloud in general? Why now? Um, one of the things that I like to think about is that a lot of people have seen people go into the cloud and come out unscathed or people have gone into the cloud and have come out and heard that it's okay. Or, Hey, if you go up, you want to make sure that you don't do this function or you don't do this activity because this is what's going to cause you problems or this is going to create a gigantic cloud bill for you. So now we have safety measures. Now we have people who have gone and have come back safely. One of the other things is that it used to be the big security and compliance bugaboo, like, oh, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do this? How are you gonna do that? All of the hyperscale clouds and even enterprise clouds have all of the same compliance regimes, have all the same security methodology and even can be more secure than your on-premises environment. So now people are looking at it and saying, this is a viable option for me. But one of the main reasons you go is agility, right? We want to be more agile. We want a faster time to market. And the reason we're looking for that is that if it takes us a long time to deliver resources, this is the same as any other process to the business. If it takes us a long time to deliver resources, they don't use our services anymore. So what we want to use, what we're trying to do with the cloud is deliver resources to them faster and be able to scale bigger. So in an on-premises environment, you have a very limited amount of resources. You have a very limited amount of physical gear that you can put your resources on. And even though we've virtualized everything and we've gotten things from taking months to deploy resources to days to hours to deploy resources, they want them now in minutes. And when you say, when a big project comes to the table and says, hey, we need a lot of resources and you don't have it or it's gonna eat most of your headroom, now you're back into the old way of doing things with physical resources and having to order things. So we want to be able to scale and scale quickly. We wanna be able to request resources from our provider and get them the same day. The other part is CapEx versus OpEx. And so a lot of IT, especially big enterprise IT has been driven around the concept of CapEx. We wanna buy this gear and we're gonna ride it out until it dies. And the problem is, is that as part of that agility, I can only buy things and hold on to it for three to four years. And if somebody wants to spin something up for six months and I go buy all this hardware, now I'm sitting here holding this gear for the next two and a half years or three and a half years. So what we're trying to do is get away from that. And by moving into an OPEX model, I can go month to month. I can start to scale up and scale down to meet seasonal needs. Things like uh, the, health, the health insurance industry. Every October, they go through their open enrollment plan. They have every one of their customers logging in to set up their plans or the same thing with retail on Black Friday and the holiday season. You have a lot of people showing up at very predictable times of the year. If you do that in a CapEx model, you have to buy for that time of year. But in the middle of June, when no one's looking at your website, you're holding on to all this gear and you really only need this much, right? You only need a much, much smaller amount. And so by moving to an OPEX model, you can have the business pay for the resources that they're really using. And so they're fine to pay the additional amount of money in November when they have all of their customers hitting the platform. And then in June, when it's quiet, they're not paying for all of those additional resources. And you're aligning IT resource utilization to business revenue generation which goes a long way with people like the CFO. Additionally, there's operational changes. This is a huge opportunity for retooling. This is where you start to look at things like automation if you haven't started automating already, or this is an opportunity to start moving your people around inside of the organization to align them to a future for themselves. Uh, I like to refer to my good friend, Steve, the storage guy. And uh, storage engineers are, uh, they've done a great job for the last couple decades, but as you start to move towards cloud, they're moving away from what they support, right? If you go to a hyperscale cloud, you don't have access to that storage array. You're just requesting resources for them. You're saying, I need this storage. And anybody can request that. It's not part of somebody provisioning it off of an array for you. That's part of what the provider's doing. So this is an opportunity to help them move into the next stage of their career through training, put some investment into the people, so that they show that you're putting, you're investing into them. So they'll invest back into the business and maintain that loyalty. This is also how you start automating. One of the big things with cloud is because you can scale up and scale down and that meter is always running. You want to automate your life cycle of all the resources that you're using. 
So when we're talking to people like David and he's looking at your applications and how you're delivering them, he's looking at the overall life cycle of how that thing scales up, how it scales down and how that application is consuming all those resources so that you don't get stuck with the bill at the end of the month going, well, we never shut it down. We just turned it on. So that whole auto automation of the life cycle of your resources is important. And for a lot of customers who are coming from a purely on-premises environment and moving out towards a hyperscale cloud or an enterprise cloud, this is the first time they've had to deal with lines of support. So in a fully on-premises environment, you have operation staff and this is your data center and this is your computer room. And when you want to go do things, you just walk in. Maybe you have a badge access, maybe you have a fingerprint reader but you're just going directly into your data center. Here, that's not necessarily the case. So understanding your lines of support, where smart hands can help you, where delivery and support organizations can help you, um, and how to interact with the support organizations of your provider become very, very important. I think this is the one that kind of gets lost in the shuffle because it's just moving in and looking at the technology. So hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, which do we want to go with? I like to break these down into three, into three pictures. The first one is hybrid cloud. This is where you have your private cloud, maybe this is your on-premises environment, connecting to a public cloud, whether that's enterprise or hyperscale. Multi-cloud is where you're using multiple public clouds, say AWS and Expedia, right? That's where you're using multiple clouds. And then you have the concept of multi-hybrid cloud, where you have your on-premises private cloud connecting to one or more clouds, public clouds. And from a consideration standpoint, we have to think about some things now. One of them, one of the big ones is connectivity. So if I have my application server on premises and I move that out to say a hyperscale cloud platform, where does my data live? Where do I have, where do I have to connect to get to my data? Do I have access to that? Do I have to build a VPN tunnel so I can access that? I'm now adding a bunch of latency into my application where I didn't have that before because everything lived in the same building, right? When I have an app server and a database server and I have one millisecond latency, no one really cares. When you have application platforms in a hyperscale cloud and your database living on premises or in a multi-cloud environment, I have my database in one cloud and I have my app in another because you're trying to do cool things on both of them, you start to introduce a whole bunch of network latency and a whole bunch of network complexity in the middle that you never had before. So consider where you're landing your applications and all of the functions of that application before really picking where you want them to go. And finally, capabilities and tooling. If you've gone out to any of the hyperscale clouds, You'll look at the tool sets that are available, things like monitoring tools, log management, security tools, compliance functions, and you'll notice that not all hyperscale clouds are viewed the same by those tool vendors, and they have a limited amount of resources to be able to do support on them. So if you want to go with, say, AWS, you're probably going to be pretty well off because they're supported by everybody. But if you look at something like GCP, chances are if you're getting support out of that tool vendor, it's going to be next year, and it's always the year after that. So as you look towards your capability, how do you make sure that what you're looking at and how you're monitoring and how you're taking care of your overall environment, your performance monitoring, how do you handle those things? There's a number of capabilities and tool sets there around automation as well, things like Terraform and Ansible, where we want to make sure that as we do these sorts of things, that we're not tying ourselves to one cloud or another if we're looking at a multi-cloud strategy. So let's pick a cloud. They're all the same, right? Not really. Um, as I mentioned before, even inside of the hyperscalers, they're not really the same. But let's, let's look at the hyperscalers overall. One of their biggest benefits is that they are great for new development. And that's largely because they have a number of platforms that are baked into their environments already, things like functions as a service and database as a service that make it really easy for developers to stand up their applications and get going without having to run through the rigmarole of an IT shop and how we actually get all those things up and running. I can just go out, pick that service, deploy a database and go. They also have really great native platforms. So, if you've tried to run big data on premises, you'll discover that big data requires big hardware. Um, trying to store all of that data and then managing that platform as you go forward, unless you have some sort of really strict compliance or regulatory requirement around doing that, trying to run things like big data on premises is really difficult. 
Um, and just, it just becomes, you just add all of that planned work on top of this new platform and new business project that you want to go do. So hyperscale clouds are really great for that because you can utilize their big scalability for storage. And then all of them have their own native big data platforms, things like Azure Data Lake or Google BigQuery to be able to handle that big data as along with AI and ML, which is really something that's been driving a lot of growth and a lot of digital transformation. How do I take and put chatbots into my uh, customer service applications? Or how do I use AI on my, uh, on my, my P&L sheet to figure out where the next, uh, the next big idea is going to come from or where are my customers going or how do I get in front of that? Um, utilizing AI and ML for that can be really helpful and doing that off of a hyperscaler can, can really benefit you because you don't have to manage the overall platform. You can just go in and consume it. From an elasticity standpoint, you have massive scale. You're paying as you go and really your limit is your wallet. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, sometimes the hyperscalers will run out. Azure's run into that a couple of times now, but they're capable of scaling far larger than most plat than most uh, on-premises environments are. And because you're doing pay as you go, if I want to build this gigantic application and run it for a weekend, I can, and I'm paying for it because I only used it for those two or three days versus buying all that hardware, bringing it in, configuring it, and then holding on to it for a depreciation cycle. And finally, SLAs. So, I want to think about the redundancy of applications in a hyperscale cloud. How do I build that in? A lot of the hyperscale clouds are application clouds and they expect you to build in all of that redundancy and all of those capabilities inside of the application itself, doing things through load balancing, reattaching uh, storage volumes, but they expect you to be there because when they need to migrate your VM, your instance or anything off, they're just going to kill it and expect it to spin up somewhere else. So your application redundancy needs to be at that level. The other part of that is from an SLA standpoint, you need to look at how some of the storage and some of the SLAs are handled. Um, I know in some of the, one of the big hyperscalers, uh, they have a, uh, a storage SLA, but it's only on certain drive types. So if you don't pick that one and you lose data, your SLAs are gone. You don't have any. So you can't really go back to them and say, this is what we need to do to make this work. On the flip side, we have enterprise clouds. So that's companies like Expedient, Rackspace, to your point. And we're really great at things like existing applications. You can bring those existing or same skills that you have on premises because they're VMware powered. You can bring those onto the platform and start to utilize those as a way to take your existing applications and just bring them in without having to change anything. And we'll get into the concept of refactoring and, and those sorts of things in a minute. But these are also great for things that are powered on 24 seven. You pay for the resource for the month, which means it's not necessarily tied to you running it. You know, I have to make sure that I only run it for the six hours a day I need that application to run. Your existing applications are largely designed to not be shut down and brought back up over and over and over again, especially if they're commodity off the shelf pieces of software. So if we need to keep them powered on, this is a great platform for it. You also have flexibility. So an enterprise cloud is also a colo. So if you have, say, uh, old mainframe or AIX or HPUX, those things aren't dead yet. And so if you have those applications running on those platforms, you can bring them in and start to keep, you, you can maintain today while still preparing for tomorrow, right? You can start to build out cloud capabilities while maintaining that mainframe or that AIX that's sitting next to it. We also have the current platforms, right? So we're running, all the, we're running all the VMware platforms, but also starting to build out container platforms. So as you start to build your cloud native applications, those platforms are available again in one cohesive unit. From a support standpoint, they're either in person or on phone, right? You have a lot of the hyperscalers don't really move down into small accounts with in-person support, uh, whether that's a sales team or, um, they, they rely heavily on the partner world like David and, and the later. Um, but in, in that in-person support, it's really hard versus having an enterprise cloud where you pick up the phone, you call and you get a person on the line. Uh, additionally, managed services options, the ability to have them do OS patching. AWS does not do OS patching. They hand you an operating system and it's up to you to maintain it. So that planned work doesn't really go away. You only eliminate some of it. Through a managed services option, you can eliminate almost all of it. And finally, from an SLA standpoint, all of the redundancy is driven at the hardware level. 
And so you don't really have to think about how do I build my redundancy so that my application doesn't go down if they do maintenance. It's all baked into the platform the same way that you're doing it on premises. That leads to higher uptime. And I think, you know, we want higher uptime for our applications, right? So when we talk about that cloud native journey and how we get there, right? We've chosen a cloud. Now, how do, what do we do with this cloud? One option is to rehost, right? Where you can pick up your application and bring it into a cloud. And it's a very short time window, right? You're talking one to three years and it's very inexpensive, right? You take your applications, you bring them in, you don't have to change anything. It's great. But if we really wanna make it fit, we start to replatform. And that's like a three to five year period as you start to write things or, you know, you, you maybe you start to look at that platform as where you start to do new development and that's where you move your applications to. And that's a three to five year process and it's a little bit more expensive. And finally, we have refactoring, which can take a very long time, especially for your very legacy applications that are almost making the jump from mainframe all the way to cloud and they skip the entire x86 client server bit in the middle, right? When you make that jump, that's a huge rewrite, but that huge rewrite can bring the biggest reward. You're putting your applications together with the right platform and you're making it work in the best way possible. So let's dive into that a little bit. If you're looking at rehosting, it's like moving your couch, right? You're going to wrap it up. It's the same couch you had before. You're just putting it in a new apartment or a new house, right? It's a lift and shift. And so there's not, there's a negative connotation to lift and shift, but one of the big benefits of lift and shift is that you don't have to actually change anything. Now, you know what it was before, you know what it's going to be when you move it, and then you can get the benefits that move around that new ecosystem. But there's a little cost optimization to it, especially if you move to a hyperscaler and you're expecting this VM or this instance or whatever to be powered on 24 seven. So if that's the case, you need to start to look at your applications and start to break them down and understand their bits and pieces and how you can make them more cloud native. And that's what the additional steps are for. One of the, ben there's a small benefit to doing it, especially if you go to a hyperscaler, but one of the big ones that we see is that customers are trying to get out of the data center business completely. They wanna be out of the physical building aspect of data centers. We've had a number of clients that have come to us and said, hey, um, we just wanna pick our VMs up and move them out because we don't wanna deal with physical infrastructure anymore. And that's been a, uh, a nice way for our customers to start to make that cloud journey. That's their first step. Right? They said, okay, I'm going to live and let go of physical infrastructure. I don't need to hug my servers anymore. I'm going to move away. And so they start to move into a cloud. And then once they're in the cloud and they say, okay, we've got some time now because I don't have to do host patching or capacity management. Now let's look at our platform. How do we re-platform this? And this is where we start to use native platforms. So if you're going to a hyperscale platform and you're looking at a database, instead of building another SQL server, Maybe you use Amazon RDS, or maybe you're on Azure, you use Azure SQL. And using those native platforms gives you the ability to have your database that you want and have a place to put your data without having to manage all of the things that go around it. You can also start to modularize your application. So this function that previously was, you know, a, a simple application server was doing like uh, alerts when certain changes happen in the database, maybe I move that out to a function. You start to modularize the chunks of your application and you start to take the big monolith and start to break it down a bit. And this is also where you can really start automating. As you start to use those native platforms, you know that everything's going to be standardized. Everything has native documentation. If you're using things like Terraform and Ansible, you can go use their providers and just immediately start using it. And then finally, refactoring. Right, this is, this is the big rewrite, this is the big jump. This is the complete rethink. I'm gonna look at my mainframe application and what does it do? And then I'm gonna write a new application to actually go build that. We're gonna modernize those applications and bring them from a legacy app to a modern platform. This is where you get the most benefit. Um, and I think David has a lot more to talk about when it comes to those benefits. So David, you wanna take, bring your slides up? Sure. All right. So yeah, um, like, uh, thanks, AJ. And so like Heidi said, my name is David Romeo. Um, and uh, just real quick, introduce myself. I'm a senior principal at Aleda. Um, and, and so with 
what AJ just talked about, I, I wanted to kind of explain the title of this portion of the talk. Um, I work with a lot of clients uh, in, in, with their enterprise architecture. And, and one of the things that becomes very clear is that any part of, uh, of a journey in digital strategy, such as you know, moving from multi to hybrid cloud or, or um, vice versa to you know, comparing enterprise cloud, it's challenging, right? Um, sometimes it feels like anything we do in IT is challenging. And I'm not gonna tell you that I have all the answers, um, but because I'm an architect at heart, I do have a framework um, that we can work through uh, sometimes for everything um, that can help us make that journey a little bit easier and make sense of that. So, but first uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about Aleda. Um, so the, for those of you that don't know, we're a digital strategy design and architecture and enterprise app dev firm. Uh, we're headquarters in Dallas, Texas, where I'm actually at currently. Um, Though we have offices in Phoenix uh, and Boise, Idaho as well. Um, and while we're only four years old, we've recently been nominated to the Inc. 500 at number 40, and we're very proud of that. Um, and while we get out of bed each morning trying to solve you know, the, the client's hardest problems, um, it's what keeps us jazzed and energized and doing what we're doing, we feel very strongly about making sure that we take care of our people in the community uh, that we live in, which is why we give back 2% of our net income to non-for-profits and charity. Um, so we're excited to be in the Phoenix market, working with all of y'all and working with some of large clients um, and, and their toughest problems. So let's get back to the main point of the talk, right? Um, so how do you make the right decisions um, with what AJ is talking about, about your journey between um, you know, rehosting, replatforming, and re-architecting? So it's not straightforward when you jump in without a strategy. Um, however, as explained earlier, I'm a framework kind of guy. I like to break it down into the three classical elements, uh, people, process, and technology. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with this, it's a framework that was introduced by an individual named Harold uh, Levat in 1964 to assist with organizational improvements. Um, and while many have attempted to uh, enhance or change the model, I believe in the simplicity of the approach as we move through a digital transformation. So as you can see, the three elements, the ordering of them is extremely important in my mind. Um, it begins with people, right? You empower to change the processes that you drive innovation through technology enablement. So it's a mouthful. Um, uh, I apologize, I didn't uh, move forward on my slides, but you can see it's people process technology, right? We're wanting to empower people that can enable the change that allow us to innovate on technology. Um, so I'm gonna go through these one by one and spend a little bit of time talking about these uh, so I can highlight uh, a few points. So beginning with people. It's important to remember that unless you fully automated everything and we're living in some kind of dy dystopian future, you still have people at the heart of your organization. There's, they're the ones that make, the, uh, make everything work, right? I mean, I'm a sociable kind of guy, you know, walking into work um, was one of the highlights of my day because I get to see everybody that I get to work with. It's a little harder now with the COVID-19 situation, but I still enjoy being able to jump on morning standups with people, um, uh, you know, have a talk with them, kind of figure out what, what's, uh, what they're doing, right? What are they doing to be able to help move a business forward? So if you think about it strategically, you've invested heavily in your people. They're, you know, they're the ones doing all of the work, right? They're the ones helping make your organization what it is. So what happens when you announce a large transformational effort? We're gonna rehost everything. We're gonna replatform everything. We're gonna go through a large re-architecture. It's all part of the digital strategy and our digital transformation. You need them to come along for the journey. You can't do it alone, right? So what do you need to do when, when, you, when you announce one of those things? Well, you've gotta motivate them, right? You've gotta to, you got explain in very clear business terms what it is and why it's important to the organization. I think the best uh, digital transformations that I've ever seen are the ones that begin with a rock solid business use case, right? And, and you know, for in IT, we all know that, you know, when you go off and you start to do something without a really good strategic plan, it can get off the rails really quickly. Same thing with people, right? When, when you don't have a plan for your people, 
especially how to motivate them, things can get off the rails really quickly. Next, it comes down to training. You know, and, and Steve, the storage guy, as AJ was talking about it, you know, I've actually had a very real situation where we had um, uh, Tony, the network guy. And Tony, um, that was his actual name, uh, he was a network engineer for um, this $3 billion company uh, for 20 years. And part of this organization, we were working with them on a digital strategy to really, uh, to, to move towards a more DevOps culture. Well, he, well, Tony got nervous. Um, and Tony got nervous because of what he was seeing, which was as we were rolling out new architectures, you know, between the, uh, the enterprise cloud and um, um, Azure in this case, uh, he saw his job kind of fading away. And so what, what did he do? Well, we didn't just say, hey, Tony, sorry, you know, great, great that you were loyal to the company for the last 20 years. Um, but, but hit the, you know, hit the road. What we did is we invested in him. And so through some training, we were able to turn uh, Tony into one of the best DevOps engineers that they currently have. And that was by relating uh, um, some concepts that he already had and some things that he was actually tinkering around with on, on the side. He was doing some coding as part of his work, right? Um, code is, you know, permeated infrastructure for a while now you know, as AJ was talking about Terraform and Ansible. And it really is the, the, you know, it's a continuation of the path of the future. But by training your people, you're able to help them come along for the journey. So you're not having, again, you're not doing this alone. You're doing this with the people that you already have that are supporting your business. They know you, you know them. So why would you not invest in them um, by training them for the path that you have on the future? And alas, it's a, it's a little bit of the same there. It's elevating them, right? They're, with any type of digital transformation, you're, you're really upending uh, the, the organization as a whole, right? Rehosting, replatforming, rearchitecting, right? It can really take a toll on, on, uh, on the people that you have, but by elevating them into new roles for the new opportunities and the new advancements that you're going to make, you ensure that, you know, that they're gonna come along uh, on the journey with you. The next we want to talk about is process, right? While people are the most important, and I feel very passionate about that, as you could tell, process is the next most important. And I promise you we're going to get to technology here in a minute. Um, but it's how you do what you do, right? Uh, the processes that you have need to be enabling your future. So part of your journey is ensuring that um, you're actually transforming those processes as you go along. You know, one of the things that, that I see is, that is really challenging, and uh, I'll use an example here. I recently had a uh, talk with a director for a development group who told me how they have to keep redesigning for the same processes, the same things that they've existed for the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And it's holding them back. Every new feature functionality that has to be going implemented, right? Especially on those re-platform and re-architecture type of things, they're having to go implement the last, you know, 10 processes that have existed for those last, you know, 20 years um, while adding the net new ones. And that's slowing them down, right? They're having to think about all of those edge cases that existed a long time ago. But why do we have to think about some of those things? Would it be an easier and faster um, for us to be able to get to market, for us to be able to do what we need to do, uh, carry less cognitive overhead. Um, if we didn't think about, for example, fax machines and supporting uh, um, whatever our new technology is. Now, in some cases, for example, you know, you can't get past it, right? Um, I was talking with our head of HR and he was talking about how he had to uh, uh, send a fax to one of the state departments and, and it had to be automated. And so it would finally send uh, at like 1 a.m. because of the challenges with that. In some cases, you have to deal with legacy uh, um, uh, infrastructure and archetypes because of the integrations that you have. But don't let it hold you back. You should be transforming uh, your processes for the future. The next thing you got to be worried about is agility, right? You have to be agile on these things. This is the, 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 the spirit of agile from a software development standpoint really should be embedded in your business and as an organization. Um, one of 
the organizations we were working with, um, you know, we got the IT department to, uh, from, you know, a very waterfall based, uh, um, you know, uh, SDLC to agile, right? Um, and some Kanban thrown in there, you know, they kind of had several teams doing different styles. But what was really holding them back at the end of the day and what really kept them from truly iterating towards the future was the agility of their, uh, of their business. They were stuck in the ways from the business processes. And while they were transforming some of them, they weren't ready to call certain new ones that they tried failures, or they weren't willing to iterate on them. They weren't willing to think about new inputs and outputs or different ways they could be combined together. And so agility really needs to be baked into the equation as you're thinking about the process. You know, when we're re-architecting, right? What are the things that we can, the extensibility points that we can put in there to allow us to be able to change things in and out when we determine that they work or they don't? And lastly, prioritization. You have to be able to, you know, it, most enterprises are huge, right? You've got tons of processes that have existed for many years. You have to be able to take those in chunks and break them down into their, their core components, prioritize them, and then start to knock them out. There are some that are gonna be critical and core to your business, especially as you're going through a business transformation. There are gonna be some that you really want to tackle because it's maybe something that you're passionate about or something that's a pet peeve of yours. But you've got to be able to take the hubris away on that, prioritize for what's best for the business, what's best for that business strategy that you've put together, what's best for the people and the direction that you're going and implement those. And in some cases, once you've implemented them, right, you can iterate on them and you could continue to iterate on them, but it might pr be prioritized really low on the stack after that point because you've knocked out the 80% of that, right? So 80, 80, 20 rule might uh, work really well here, but it's something that we help our clients a lot on because sometimes when you're part of the equation, it's hard to be able to prioritize effectively. Sometimes you kind of need a third eye to be able to take a look at it. So then that brings us to technology. So how do we fit the people in the process together? Well, it's technology. Uh, so, so Real quick before we dive into this, you know, when I started my career, I was a developer. I loved solving problems through code. Uh, but what I learned was that not everything can be solved by writing code. Um, unfortunately, I learned that several times in the, in the hard way. Um, you know, or, or more code, right? Better patterns and practices. But the problem is, is it has to start with people in process. You know, if you don't bring the people along, you're not going to be able to have the, the foundation that you need. And if your processes aren't good, then your technology won't follow as well. And there's, you know, in architecture, there's, uh, there, there's some design theorems around making sure that your technology follows your business processes. And I've seen technology be the most effective, implemented the most elegant when it follows your business. It's not just cool for cool sake. Right, we can have the best microservices hosted on Kubernetes, um, spanning between multiple different clouds, uh, with data integration using a Kafka backend um, with unidirectional data flow. But that doesn't mean anything if we don't set up the people and processes to to support that. Right, or or our technology rather supports them based off of how we've developed that. So with that, it's a means to an end, right? It shouldn't be the thing that we start with. It shouldn't be the thing that we sit there and we say, you know what, I've got the best technology, but you know what, I don't have the best people or processes or I've lost them along the way. I've lost sight of that. Um, I will caveat this just like any good consultant and say sometimes this does depend. Uh, in some cases, you do have to use technology to be able to get you uh, the agility to think about uh, iterating on processes. And in some cases, you have to use technology to allow people to move beyond their day jobs to that next new job, right, or that next thing. Um, but it's the enabler, right? It's not the end state, and it's how you go along on your journey. One really important thing here, you know, Legos, uh, not Play-Doh, right, or Legos, uh, Play-Doh to Legos, right? As you're going through your journey, you need to ask yourself, how is what I'm building today going to be leveraged in the future, right? Um, and if it's not, or it can't, that's fine. It might be a bridge. It might be a rehost type of thing. But if it needs to be 
uh, if it's going to be something that you're going to invest time and effort into, and it's going to be something that is going to be with you for a while, you know, it, it needs to be built in a modular way, right? And so the analogy here, right, Plato, it's, once it's pushed together, it's very hard to pull apart. Um, you know, I don't know why it, it hurts me so much when my daughter, who's two, decides to put the green and the blue Play-Doh together, you know, but, but it happens, right? But it's impossible to bring apart. And, you know, we've many shed tears from a toddler on that. But with Legos, right, it's very easy to be able to take that apart and put them back together in a new fashion. And so as we're looking at the future technology and as we're using that to enable our processes and our people, we should be doing it in a modular way. It should be done in some way that if anything kind of, uh, if our journey changes or we, we do some A-B testing and we realize maybe we're, we're not going down the best path or we, we wanna tweak some things, right? We don't want everything to have to start over at square one. We need to be modular in that fashion. And lastly, it's an evaluate and evolve type of situation, right? Um, so, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to be afraid to iterate and you have to do that in a sustainable format. It has to be combined with people and process, right? Um, you know, you, you have to be able to plug something in, right? Test it. And if it doesn't work, be able to pull it back out, right? Um, you know, that emphasizes the Legos, the Play-Doh fashion, right? That, that is something that, that is kind of an underpinning of that. But then if you notice the tone throughout all of this, it's agility. It's something that you can use to be able to iterate on. And this is something that we work with our clients quite a bit on in order to be able to help them understand how agile are they, right? How, how likely are they, uh, you know, to, to uh, succeed in certain uh, implementations? Um, you know, one thing that we talk a lot about is uh, the shift from uh, mean time to recovery to mean time to, uh, or sorry, from mean time to failure to mean time to recovery, right? Historically, we're used to how, how long can I keep my system stable? In some cases, we need to be focused on how quickly can I get it back up and running? And so that's kind of a theme of an agility here, right? We need to evaluate our practices and evolve with them rather than kind of hold on to those legacy ideas because those are really what's going to keep us from reaching our true potential when it comes to a digital strategy or evaluating the best ROI and bang for our buck as we go through, you know, your hybrid cloud or multi-cloud journey. So, Getting started is hard, not getting started is harder. And I, and I understand, you know, it's, it's motivational for a reason, it's a little kitschy. Um, but as I was putting this talk together, you know, it, it's something that always impresses me is how fast we're advancing with technology. And it's going so fast that we can barely keep up, right? Business is generally lagging behind. And it doesn't have to be like that. You, you don't want to be on the in some cases, you don't want to be on the bleeding edge, right? Taking every lick and turn and implementing every new JavaScript framework that comes out there, right? Because that's a world that changes very fast. But if we think about it, right, we have to get going because the disruptors aren't the ones with the best idea now. They're the ones that get started iterating now. It, you know, technologies and, and your people and your processes, they're an investment that you, you know, with compounding interest. So treat it like one. So if you invest now, you'll reap the rewards, much greater rewards later, rather than something that if you, you, you're saying, well, I can't do this because of this one reason, right? Um, that's something that, that generally is a legacy idea. You can get past that and you can get started. So getting started is hard, right? But you got to get going. So with that, I guess we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, if there's any questions out there um, uh, around either hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, or any of the, the business process and strategy pieces that we've talked about, uh, AJ and I will be uh, happy to answer them. Yeah, and if you're uh, an attendee, you can put the questions into the Q&A panel. Uh, Rob McCafferty and Heidi have been answering questions um, in the Q&A uh, but also if you guys want to unmute and just ask questions, you can do that. I have one. Um, I think this one is probably for Aleda. Um, digital transformation is such a broad term. Is this something that is specific to each organization? 
It is. Uh, you know, I've got a blog post coming out soon that kind of dives a little bit more into that. But the idea is that a digital strategy, you know, you, you can look to, um, you can look out there to the market kind of um, for, for ideas and inspiration, but you have to internalize it and really make it your own. It, it comes with understanding, um, you know, what, what's, what's possible. It's a little bit of the art of the possible in some of, if you're a design thinking uh, type uh, type of person. Um, in some cases, it's just understanding what are your competitors doing, right? Let's do a competitive analysis or a market scan and understand what are the different ways that you can iterate on that. In some cases, it's actually just doing what you're doing and getting better at it, more efficient, right? That operational efficiency type thing. Um, and, and so I would say, you know, digital strategy is uh, in my mind, it's the evolution of people, process, and technology within your organization. It's not something like, hey, we're going to go to microservices. Perfect. Um, I think this would be a great uh, question to ask both panelists. Um, when you talk about cloud or digital transformation, what are your thoughts on employee displacement? Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in first. Yeah. Uh, in terms of employee displacement, that's kind of where I, I mentioned the, the whole concept of reinvesting. Um, I think there is, uh, there's a level of, there's a level of idea where people, when they want to get that, you know, full ROI, that full TCO, they think that they have to let people go. Uh, because they're trying to look at that full bottom line on the revenue sheet. This is the amount of money we spend on staffing. This is the amount of money we spend on infrastructure. This is the amount of money we spend on applications. And they're trying to figure out how to do that. And I think one of the challenges is that they think they're going to get rid of people and they don't realize that even though you've moved to the cloud, you still have to manage all these applications. There's still a ton of institutional knowledge that people in these organizations have around their applications. So letting those people go, not only is just a, a, a not great idea from a technical standpoint, I think there's also a, a historical aspect to it. Um, and reinvesting into them and retraining them or giving them the capability to start to learn cloud um, gives them the ability to grow, it builds that loyalty internally and helps build a, a uh, gives them an opportunity to maybe try something different that they haven't tried before, right? Maybe the storage guy came in as a storage guy and never really got a chance to do anything else. And he's wanted to, but he just never really could make the move to somewhere else. And this is a new opportunity for them. And that reinvigorates them and, and brings that energy back in uh, maybe from when they started. So I think from an employee displacement standpoint, if we go down that road, we don't necessarily want to uh, eliminate jobs. I think there's still very much a people aspect like David mentioned around maintaining those people and giving them the opportunity to make uh, you know, a move for their career and a move for their future. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that as well. Um, you know, the, I'll, I'll use an example that we had. So we do, uh, we, ha we have a fairly large um, RPA, repro robotic processing automation practice within Aleda. And one of our clients, which is um, one of the nation's largest retailers, uh, wanted to use RPA to help automate um, a ton of processes. So we helped them set up a center of excellence and started churning through their backlog from uh, of bots that, that we needed to build. And one of the things I don't, you know, if you know a, a bit about RPA is, you know, you've got different types of bots between autonomous bots um, and managed bots, right? And what we found is, is that of the processes, you know, there there's a few that you can make truly autonomous. But what happens is, is there's actually a fair amount that end up needing some type of human input at some point, right? Whether it's, uh, we want to make sure that the items that are, you know, in this case, it was the impact to the GL, because we were automating some GL entries uh, from some green screen applications, was actually what was needing to happen, right? And then over time, that, that process could go from a human intervention to truly autonomous. But in in the people case, right, you still needed the same amount of people, but what you did is you freed up their time to be able to focus on other high value targets, right? And so it's that, that's that uh, high value work piece that AJ was kind of talking about at the very beginning there um, that, that makes the most sense, right? So 
from an employee displacement standpoint, I would say it's about investing in people and finding ways to leverage the people that you have on the journey that you're about to undertake, rather than sitting there saying, I'm going to save a ton of cash by, by being able to uh, cut my head count by half. Wonderful, thank you. Um, AJ, I think this one is for you. Public versus enterprise cloud versus on-prem. What is better for which situation? Um, I think if we're looking at public, I, I like to refer to those as hyperscale clouds. So that's the, the big three, AWS, Azure, and GCP. Um, those are for those are really great when you want to use their specific platforms. You want to use Amazon RDS or you want to use Google BigQuery or AIML or something like that, where there is a specific platform portion of that that you want to go use. When you start to look at their regular infrastructure as a service, there's not exactly a ton of value. Um, I think uh, an enterprise cloud does a really great job of enterprise as a service or uh, enterprise infrastructure as a service, excuse me, um, because we can handle a lot of those, uh, you know, always on commodity software uh, applications. At the same time, I think there's still a little bit of value in on-prem, uh, especially when we start talking about edge computing. Um, and we start looking at things that really need to be local to the end user. Um, things like domain controllers, you know, authentication, that can be a challenge, especially when you got to go across really bad WAN links, um, if, you know, rural, remote, you know, robo sort of situation. So I think there's still some value in the on-premises world. Um, but I think a lot of that value is driven away at the data center level and at the distribution level, because you can get so much more scalability and so much more flexibility and agility by moving out to an enterprise or hyperscale cloud. So if we were going to look at, um, it, it really depends on the actual use case. It's, it's one of those, like, I don't really have a great answer of just like, if it's A, do X, if it's B, do Y, it doesn't, it doesn't line up that cleanly. Um, and this is why a lot of times when we sit down um, with customers, we start to talk through what they're really trying to do. What is their overall solution? What are their real pain points? Not so much the technology aspect, not, you know, I need to run my VMs, okay anywhere can run them. It's what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to work on automation? Are you trying to get away from, you know, managing ESX hosts? Do you want to have di better disaster recovery? Or do you want to have, uh, you know, more scalability to your platform? What are you really looking to do as an overall goal versus just thinking about the technology? And that comes back to David's message around people, process, and technology is what is the end goal of your digital transformation? What does that look like? If you had to close your eyes, money's no object, what do you want the business to actually look like? And then you start to work your way towards that. And maybe it's, hey, being in the data center business stinks. We don't want to make maintain the power and the cooling and all of this other stuff and the very large capital expenditures that go with that. We want to get out of that, but we're not really ready to go fully rip apart our applications. It's a great move to an enterprise cloud. If you start to then say, okay, we don't want to be in that business. We want to migrate out and we really want to move towards functions as a service because we think that's going to be a better way for us to deliver our applications, then it's like, okay, maybe we start to bring in some of that hyperscale capability. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily a today you're on premises, tomorrow you're in the cloud. It's a process. It's a journey. That's why we keep talking about it as a cloud journey. Um, so when we're, when we're going through that, trying to understand what is at the end of that journey and then what needs to happen from point A to, to, from, to point Z. David, do you have anything to add? I, I would just say, you know, it, exactly right. It, the best consulting answer, it depends in this case. Um, you know, quite often what I see is it's a mixture of all of those pieces together. Um, you know, the, the one popular one that's happening right now that uh, you know, AJ mentioned briefly is uh, machine learning, right? And, and the massive amount of compute that you need in order to do that. And I've had a client that was in their, you know, they, they have their own data center. And when they looked at procuring the amount of GPUs, they needed to be able to do the uh, type of ML calculations that they needed. It just wasn't feasible. Um, and so that's where a hyperscale cloud can be a real benefit. But uh, then you've got to take into certain considerations about shipping data back and forth between those things uh, and then the model back 
uh, on uh, to your to your data center to be able to do what you need to do. Um, and so there's particular patterns and practices and considerations that we would take into that. But there's no, you know, it, there, there's no real one. Um, nobody I, I've seen has a really solid framework to be able to say if then that for the types of clouds that we're talking about here. Perfect. Well, we're just coming up on the hour. Um, does If anybody has any last questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, as a reminder, everybody will be receiving a recording of this webinar in the next day. Um, we will also be randomly drawing winners. Um, we have two backpacks that we're going to be giving away and the big prize of the $100 Amex gift card. So um, watch your inbox. Um, you could be a lucky winner. And if you have any additional questions, um, certainly feel free to reach out to the panelists. You can see their contact information below. Um, I think it's very safe to say that, um, you know, to AJ's point, this is a journey um, and you don't have to make these decisions on your own and both Expedient and Aleda are here to help you with those tough decisions. So thank you everybody for attending and um, reach, out to, reach out to the panelists if you have any questions. Thanks everybody. Thank you.